Hello everybody and welcome to another uh, webinar by the Institute of Classical Osteopathy. Um, my name is Diego Gomez. I am the chairman of the Institute of Classical Osteopathy and today I'm talking, I am connecting from uh, Spain. Um, and today we have uh, Mervyn Wallman. Uh, just been told that we have reached the maximum capacity for this webinar, 100 people. And there are people all around the world. So hello everyone. Hola, que tal? And um, I hope you enjoy this webinar. We have Mervyn Wallman, who is uh, probably most of you know him, but he's the president of the ICO. He is the ambassador of the ICO. We just named him new ambassador in the last uh, ICO conference that we had in London last uh, month in February. And then uh, maybe he, he's um, uh, one of the, the, the most experienced osteopaths in the UK. Uh, he graduated almost 50 years ago now from the BCom, British College of Osteopathic Medicine in London. He worked as a um, technique tutor, uh, teacher um, in the European School of Osteopathy in Mainstone with uh, Tom Dama. Also, he, he had a very good relationship with uh, John Wernham and he worked along with uh, Mr. Wernham doing editing different books and, and videos. And also, uh, Melvin Wallman, he was uh, the last uh, student of Thomas Edward Hall. Uh, Thomas Edward Hall was a direct student of uh, John Martin Little John, the same as John Wernham. So at the ICO, we feel it's a privilege and, and we are very happy that Melvin Wallman has, a, has got a direct connection, direct learning with the founders of osteopathy. And we, we just um, love the experience that he transmits in his words and his teachings. And uh, we do appreciate that he's here with us today. Uh, his uh, subject uh, for this webinar, the treatment of uh, lung uh, infections, is well, the trending topic this month uh, with uh, the coronavirus. So I will let you uh, this webinar with him and um, i see you soon. Bye-bye. Well, we definitely are in a very interesting period medically. Um, it's possibly the main reason I wanted to make a presentation of this kind on respiratory diseases. Um, by coincidence, I was treating a very sick infant in the hospital about two months ago with um, a syncytial viral respiratory infection and realized that many members, many osteopaths do not know or have never seen how osteopathy can be practiced um, with infectious diseases um, as an adjuvant doesn't have to be a standalone treatment, but together with medical colleagues in a life and death situation uh, and at the hospital bedside. And it struck me that it would be of value to film the treatment protocol that I was using, um, put it on YouTube and it is there available with a long introduction in which I try to explain the principles behind what it is that I'm doing. That occurred just before the pandemic broke out, and quite a coincidence. Um, and since the pandemic broke out, I realized that it would be worth perhaps going into greater depth um, in terms of the practical nature of the work done at the bedside with respiratory diseases um, to take a, an introductory look. And I deliberately call it an introduction because it's a very big field. Um, there are many ways in which one can approach a patient suffering a respiratory disease, depending on their age, depending on the stage of the disease, depending on whether the patient is housebound or within a hospital setting, all of which require a different kind of protocol. So all I can do today is perhaps excite your interest in the subject remind you of the immense amount of clinical experience which is already there in over a hundred years of its practice by those few osteopaths that 
continue practicing osteopathic medicine uh, outside of America um, and hope that that interest will inspire you uh, to continue studying the subject in greater depth. Um, just a few words. I'm indebted for this classical approach in the treatment of respiratory infections to the clinical notes of Little John, but also of McConnell. McConnell was truly far ahead of his time, um, and I'll bring him into the lecture, if I can, a little later, when we talk about some of the basic principles behind what we're doing on the patient when they are suffering a disease. And of course, I'm indebted to my two mentors that Diego had um, kindly reminded the audience uh, that I worked with and studied with, which was John Wernham and Edward Hall, whose demonstration of what I will show you in the video uh, lies behind almost everything that I actually do on a daily basis clinically. So I'm indebted to them uh, for all my working life. Um, what kind of respiratory diseases do I tend to see? They tend to generally be patients who are suffering either the consequences of chronic obstructive pulmonary disease with or without opportunist infections imposed upon the disease, such as pneumonia, some of whom I will be seeing, seeing in my clinical practice if they're in the early stages. Um, in their later stages, I may be visiting them at the home bedside and sometimes in the critical stages at the hospital bedside. The other um, consequence of that very prevalent disease is of course emphysema, and that is often treated uh, in the clinical setting. Um, another yearly frequent respiratory condition that I'm called on to treat is of course influenza. It kills more people than the COVID-19 virus yearly um, and is something that I have to deal with in my family practice, but occasionally in the hospital as well. Um, amongst the very young that present with a respiratory illness, it tends to be um, the viral infection of syncytial viral infection and that is what I showed in the YouTube video that is accessible to you at any time you wish to look at it. Um, it is very different treating a patient who is critically ill compared to someone who is with a chronic respiratory disease. A critically ill patient, whether it's a child or an adult, must be handled with extreme care. They're on the point of exhaustion anyway. It's so easy to overtreat, to spend too long over the treatment, for the treatment to be forceful, excessively forceful. And it's very easy to use methods that are not appropriate. Uh, for example, it's become very fashionable to think of the lymphatic pump procedures, whether it's the splenic pump or the liver pump or the thoracic pump as being lifesavers. They can be in certain situations and in certain respiratory disease situations at certain stages, but at other stages, particularly in the later stages of those diseases, they can kill a patient. They're too powerful, they're too strong. If it's an autoimmune reaction, such as possibly this COVID-19 uh, viral infection, then they would be not appropriate. They would be contraindicated because you wouldn't want to recruit leukocytes beyond what is already happening as a massive discharge because of this almost autoimmune reaction going. There you'd want to dampen the leukocyte recruitment, certainly during the critical period of the infection. So it is very important that one has a deep awareness of the pathology under one's hands when one intends to treat a respiratory disease. Which means that one has to undertake a medical examination. It's not a complicated examination, but it does require you to check whether the 
uh, lung sounds are in an advanced stage of a uh, disease or whether they're still in the early stages, whether the patient has a temperature, whether the lymph glands are swollen, and if so, where, whether there's an opportunist su infection superimposed upon the respiratory infection, such as in the eyes, ears, nose, or throat, and they have to be examined, and it doesn't take long to do that. To examine a person's ears for a middle ear infection doesn't take more than a few seconds. Examining a throat is something that is a standard procedure that must be done. Of course, in a hospital setting, one's got the advantage of having the opportunity to have the lung imaging done and laboratory tests done in terms of sputum and blood tests. And that gives you a far deeper picture of the pathology that one's handling. But that isn't necessary in the vast majority of cases that are seen by a family practitioner, whether it's a family doctor or a family osteopath. Most diseases can be dealt with, most respiratory diseases can be dealt with in their early stages without um, major diagnostic procedures necessarily. Okay. Um, before I get into the talk itself, I do have to say a few words about the current um, stand taken by the British osteopathic authorities um, and also the osteopathic colleges of education when it comes to uh, COVID-19. Uh, it is very painful to hear them prevent or discourage osteopaths from helping what could be their near relatives or their close friends who are suffering from the disease not even encouraging students to learn how procedures have been um, undertaken for over a century in the treatment of respiratory diseases that could make a difference. Working alongside doctors, possibly within a hospital setting. Because when you read, as Diego did clearly uh, make clear to us all, the statement put out by the physiotherapists, the charter the British Chartered Society of Physiotherapists clearly states that they recognize that physiotherapy is essential to treating COVID-19 now and in the long term. And it is truly disappointing that the osteopathic profession in Britain hasn't got the courage to say something similar. Of course, it would require more than just saying something similar. It would require training students to be able to treat infectious diseases. It's just not done in Britain. It hasn't been done since little John died in 1947. The reason given is truly laughable. The fact that there isn't sufficient research evidence for the value of osteopathic treatment in respiratory diseases, let alone COVID-19, is not an excuse. The physiotherapists don't have any more research evidence for the value of their work, but they're readily called in by every medical facility treating infectious diseases. The fact that most surgery is not based on the findings of double-blind placebo-controlled trials doesn't prevent people practicing surgery or wanting to have surgery where necessary. It's based upon the clinical results and the clinical experience. Of course, more trials should be done, but until they are done, the best we have is clinical experience. So I do hope that this pandemic may wake up the osteopathic profession, not just in Britain, the same goes in Europe, and perhaps to some degree also in America. Although I do personally know American osteopaths working at this moment with seriously ill COVID-19 patients in the hospital settings of America. Tragic that British osteopathic students are not encouraged to at least learn what they're doing, even if it means just treating their own patient, their own family who may be sick. It's a wasted opportunity, I think. This pandemic could have done for osteopathy what 
the influenza epidemic did, did to American osteopathy over 100 years ago. It put osteopathy in many ways on the map. The results were seemingly so good that people took notice of osteopaths and what they were doing. It could have happened, and it could happen in this country, in Britain, for example, if we had been prepared uh, to offer our services. It's, it's actually quite amusing. Just by chance, a few days ago, I came across a statement that on the subject of, um, of uh, research evidence being the ultimate uh, um, reason for one to uh, follow a particular line of uh, action, then in fact, even Einstein's theories, including the existence of gravitational waves, which he proposed in 1917, was only empirically confirmed in 2016. Maybe there's still hope, maybe there's still hope. Especially when people like Luciordani and uh, Hodge are trying very hard to uh, get back to uh, trying to see whether the founding principles of osteopathy are valid on a good scientific research basis. So let me now get on to the actual subject of this, uh, this webinar and just make a few key points. I, I don't want to spend long um, on the principles behind the techniques that you'll be looking at. I deliberately wrote up um, quite extensively um, a introduction to the, this video, um, which will be seen on YouTube when we do upload it in the next few days. And I would hope that anyone listening to this webinar will spend time reading and rereading those principles, because without them, in no way can the operator practice intelligently. These principles are put into the language of modern neurophysiology, and I feel they will give the operator the depth of understanding, or at least an introduction to the depth of understanding as to why we do what we do at the bedside of the sick patient. But I'm not going to go into that in any depth on this webinar. I'd like to make it a somewhat easier um, webinar for viewers so that they can enjoy the, the um, video as it stands. And I'll be explaining some of the basic things going on at the same time. Um, but before we go into it, let me just make a few very quick key points. Um, the ex osteopathic examination is as important as the medical examination. It follows the osteopath, the medical examination. And what we are looking for time and again, with as much concentration of effort as possible, is the presence and the extent of any somatic component that may be accompanying that disease condition. Because if we can find the somatic component, it often expresses itself via tenderness or changes in pseudomotor activity or temperature changes. If we can find that somatic component that may be related to the disease, and if we can improve that somatic component, it can be the key to an effective treatment response. It's probably the most powerful way that is improving the somatic component that we can affect neuronal signaling through the peripheral nervous system into the central nervous system. In the hope that we can modulate that central nervous system response to the, to the disease in terms of its neuroendocrine and immune response to the infection. So time and again, what we're doing with our hands is an attempt to affect neuronal signaling. We try to keep that in mind when we watch the video. As I said, I go into that in far more detail in the text that accompanies the video 
that will be shown on, on YouTube. So we're trying to affect and improve any dysregulation. And we always try to remember that the body's response in an infection is a self-reparative response. It's an attempt by the body to deal with the infection. So very often there's a fever, every, very often there's a rise in temperature, and we certainly don't want to suppress it. We want to make sure that it doesn't become dangerous and we may have to lower that temperature. But if the patient's health and vigor can sustain a temperature of between 40 to 42 degrees centigrade, then most viruses and most bacteria are destroyed at that temperature. That's a very important point that I'm making now, that the body's self-reparative mechanisms produce many of the symptoms in disease conditions, including respiratory diseases. And very often, it's not a matter of suppressing those symptoms. It's a matter of assisting the body to cope with that healing crisis that is going on at the time of the infection and making sure that it doesn't overwhelm the patient. Okay, again I repeat that each patient requires a distinctly individualized treatment protocol. All I can show you are the methods that are used very often, but what applies to an individual patient might be quite, is very often quite distinct. Uh, there are no formulas to follow, only guidelines. And the somatic component is expressed differently in every patient. And it even changes, the somatic component even changes during each stage of the illness and often as a reaction to what you've done during the treatment. Perhaps one thing might be kept in mind as you watch the video. It's a general principle in almost all respiratory diseases, apart from perhaps asthma. That principle is that every effort is made to prevent the buildup of pulmonary lymphatic stasis and pulmonary alveoli fluid congestion. Because in a condition of lymphatic stasis, pulmonary lymphatic stasis and pulmonary congestion, you have produced, or the condition has produced, an ideal breeding ground for bacteria and viruses. So behind many of the maneuvers and protocols that you will be seeing me apply in the video, keep that principle in mind. The attempt time and again through the vasomotor system, and don't forget that there's a sympathetic nervous system supply to lymphatic vessels, not all of them, but many of them. And in terms of changing thoracic and abdominal pressure conditions, your attempt or the attempt is being made to ensure adequate lymphatic flow through the pulmonary system and the prevention of the buildup of pulmonary congestion. So with that in mind, um, let's now move on to the video. And if I can remember my instructions, I go into share screen and I move into what I hope will come up. Yes. And give me a moment, please, to find where I wish to start. Almost there. That's too far. Just forgive me for a moment. Okay. With the patient in the sitting that. position, and it's demonstrated One in the following sequence. Okay, there's a accompanying talk that I produced when I produced this video. I'll let it run in sections, and at the end of most sections, I'll add a few comments about what we've been watching. What we're going to start with is the patient, the model in this case, um, in the sitting position. And I deliberately started in the sitting position because if the patient is ill and you're making a house visit or a hospital visit, because of the nature of 
home bed or a hospital bed and its softness and lack of resistance, you are unable to perform many of the techniques that you're familiar with uh, as easily or as effectively as you can on your own private clinic osteopathic table. You need resistance to the springing effects of our maneuvers. In the sitting position, on the other hand, you can perform almost all maneuvers very effectively um, if the patient has the strength to sit up uh, on a stool or on a chair. And that's the reason I've started with the patient in the sitting position. 80% of all osteopathy is examination and diagnosis. And that's a very bold statement. 80% is examination and diagnosis. You've got to be alert to the most subtle changes under your hands as you introduce the maneuvers and the leverages through which we test um, for any somatic component. But before you move the patient, palpation can often be a very simple procedure where we lightly run the hand along the spine of the patient to check as to whether there are pseudomotor changes, points of stickiness, for example, or dampness, or changes of temperature along the spine. Those are key findings in even the most complicated cases where you may be lost to find the more obvious somatic components, but can immediately direct you as to where there may already be dysregulation of the sympathetic nervous system, showing up as pseudomotor changes or changes in temperature in the skin under your hands. So running the hand along the spine is often the simplest and yet the most important and effective diagnostic procedure. The sitting position enables extensive, rapid and comfortable examination of the whole spine, ribs and their myofascial attachments. From superficial to deep, palpatory search is made for pseudomotor and localized thermal abnormality expressed as hot or cold spots. All movement procedures must be conducted rhythmically in order to detect degrees of arrhythmicity and thus location of potential dysfunction. A hallmark of classical osteopathy is that within one sequential flow of movement, these same examination maneuvers can become surgically precise treatment procedures when dysfunction is met. Mm. Okay. In that brief introduction, you have many of the basic principles of classical osteopathy. I just want to make a quick point here. Um, take great note of the close proximity of the operator to the patient. Almost all classical maneuvers require the operator to move his body um, to a degree that prevents his arms doing too much work. The arms remain sensory organs as much as motor organs. And that means that the operator has to use his body weight to a very great degree for the most simple of maneuvers, also in, in order not to tire quickly. Let's continue. Next is shown the search and treatment within the anterior throat myofascia for any undue tension or resistance to movement that may cause neuro, microvascular or lymphatic compromise. Moving from superficial to deep, the head and neck are used as a lever to simultaneously relax and tighten the structures under the operator's palpating and treating hand. Once again, the key is diagnosis. The first few seconds are spent trying to determine whether there's any somatic changes under the operator's hand that indicate that there is a somatic component that can be perhaps relieved by the operator's treatment procedures. You're looking for anything, time and again, almost everywhere in the body, for anything that can, that can produce neuro or microvascular or lymphatic compromise, whether it's uh, soft tissue tension, muscular tension, ligamentous tension. Um, those are the factors from the earliest days in osteopathy were considered 
essential elements that could prevent the body's self-reparative mechanisms from working efficiently. Where there's an infection, and particularly where there's a secondary opportunist infection of the ears or the nose or the throat, then this procedure can be invaluable in relaxing those soft tissues and fascia and allow a greater flow of lymphatic fluid into the thoracic inlet, drainage of the infected area. Interesting in treating the thoracic spine, the operator's thena and hypothena eminences are placed over the articular processes, the spinous processes lying between, while coupled side bending and rotatory vectors are introduced down to the specific segment by both the arm leverage of the patient and the operator's wrists and fingers. The side bending and rotatory maneuvers are almost impossible to see on this particular maneuver. And they're so small. But why are they so small? We're talking about side bending to a particular segment, rotation down to and in a segment. So we're not talking about the need for massive ranges of motion. We're talking about specific, highly um, directed and accurately directed leverages down to particular articular elements of the spine. If capable, the patient clasps his arms around the operator in order to enable specific intersegmental traction targeted by the operator's wrists, forearms and fingers as fulcra, focusing and stabilizing the segment. Flexion, extension, rotation and side bending coupled movements are introduced to both diagnose and treat points of resistance. If the patient is too debilitated to raise his arms and the operator inserts his hands and wrists the armpits of the patient's lowered arms. This is a variation on one of the most famous techniques by Still, in fact. And it always makes me smile when I'm using this perhaps in a hospital surrounded by all the paraphernalia of 21st century modern medicine. And here it is, I'm using something that's over 120 years old and is still as valuable today as it was then. Diagnosis and treatment. It can, it's one continuum. You check, you recheck, you treat a little, you check again. It's a continuous rhythmic flow. That point about rhythm, by the way, is one of the essential hallmarks of classical osteopathic diagnosis. Very often, you won't find gross tissue tension uh, to be a, a, an indicator of a somatic dysfunction, particularly on the, in the child or the infant where the body is so soft, so yielding. Um, I have always found it very difficult to find such gross uh, phenomena. But what you do find, but again, it requires a lot of concentration, is a slight change in rhythmicity of the tissues under your hands if they are in a condition of dysfunction. That may be the only key we have as to where to focus our attention for treatment. The examination and treatment of points of resistance of the anterior costal articulations is demonstrated. The arm is elevated at the precise angle needed to engage the moving rib fulcrum fixation of thumb or fingers above or below the rib shaft to enable strong mechanotransduction effects on the underlying nociceptors, proprioceptors and mechanoreceptors. Note that palpatory feedback is always from fulcra and lever. That is a very important point. The operator is not just palpating with his right hand, for example, as we see this particular picture. His left hand, holding the, the, the patient's limb as a lever, is telling him as much information about the conjoint action between arm and that rib shaft, as is the right hand of the operator, detecting the movement of that shaft. The dysfunction is so often a matter of conjoint dysfunction, often areas quite distant but anatomically related. And treatment, therefore, is as much applied to the distant part as it may be to the local part, to the lever that produces the conjoint action.
Notice again the proximity of the operator to the patient that stabilizes the patient's body so that the movement is entirely focused to the rib. The search is yeah. continuously for points of resistance, soft tissue or hard tissue, points of resistance. The head and neck is being used as a dynamic lever for the diagnosis and treatment of the cervical spine. The operator's forearm and flexed wrist splint the patient's neck for safety to avoid undue side bending while introducing coupled flexion, extension and rotation. It is a continuous rhythmic interplay between lever and fulcrum, not least to determine by tissue reaction when it is time to terminate the maneuver to avoid irritation and damage to highly reactive connected tissue during fever states. When do you stop? When is enough enough? When might more be potentially highly irritating and, and dangerous? That is one of the most difficult questions in osteopathy to answer. And if we've got time at the end, perhaps uh, someone can ask that question again and I'll try to explain in more detail. In order to introduce and to induce down regulation of the sympathetic nervous system, bilateral thumb pressure is applied slowly and rhythmically from transverse process to the superior and laterally located transverse processes of the same segment, moving the erector spinae superiorly and laterally ahead of the thumbs. The attempt is to approximate as closely as possible to the underlying posterior medial ramus of the underlying sensory nerves, the osteopathic peripheral portal of entry to the dorsal root ganglion, central and autonomic nervous systems. This is possibly one of the oldest maneuvers in osteopathy, and it's one of the most forgotten. And in the treatment of diseases, certainly in the treatment of infectious diseases, it is one of the most important. It may be the only maneuver used in some of the most serious conditions and at the most serious stages of a disease. Uh, this may be the only one that could be appropriate, for example, in the COVID-19 patient who is already on death's door. Anything more than this could tip the scales, but this may be one of the most essential maneuvers that we have for down-regulating excessive sympathetic uh, discharge. The fingers, the thumbs are approximated as closely as possible to the um, dorsal branch of the uh, spinal sensory nerve, uh, the medial branch particularly, uh, and it has to be done very accurately. Notice that it's the body's, the, the operator's body weight that applies the pressure, not his muscles of his arms or hands, so that the hands and the thumbs remain very accurate sensory organs, determining how deep to go and for how long to press. You may ask, what determines the rhythm, the pace of the rhythm? Again, that's a fascinating question and the answer has to be given and I may well give it to you at the end. Next scene are splenic and hepatic pump procedures employed to enable leukocyte recruitment, but only if without causing discomfort or pain, and may be contraindicated in the presence of significant splenomegaly, hepatomegaly, or atrophy. We are extremely lucky if the patient is conscious. What do I mean by that? I don't envy um, veterinary osteopaths. Where you have a conscious patient, they can clearly tell you whether something is painful. And there is nothing like a painful response to warn the operator that this may be contraindicated. When it comes to splenic or liver pumps, inevitably, if there's a degree of hepatomegaly or splenomegaly, then there will be a painful response as you apply these pressures, even light pressures of the kind that you're seeing here on this demonstration. So take pain anywhere in the body as a warning signal to the operator to think twice as to how he's doing, what he's doing, and whether it's necessary what he's doing. It is a mixture of rhythmic bilateral 
mobilization and simultaneous squeeze pump maneuver. It's depth and rhythm determined by the absence of discomfort and organ resistance to the bimanual pressures. What I'd like you to do is also think about what effect, for example, this left hand, the thena and hypothena eminence, close to the costal angle, what effect that may have on the sympathetic ganglia, the sympathetic ganglia on a chain millimeters away from that pressure. In other words, one hand is possibly affecting the sympathetic ganglia, the other hand directly uh, mobilizing the, the organ beneath the two hands. We're talking about a mechanotransduction effect via the mechanoreceptors under the operator's hands. And basically what we're seeing is a complete treatment in the sitting position. The sideline position may be the only comfortable and effective position in which to treat the home patient who is usually confined to a low home bed with a soft mattress. It allows for maximum relaxation of the erector spinae and allows for excellent and usually pain-free diagnosis and treatment of points of resistance. The operator uses his body weight on the pelvis or resting on the shoulder to stabilize the patient and focus the leverage forces. The whole spine is available in this position other than the neck. That isn't, isn't the case in fact. I'm going to show you how the neck is also treated in the sideline position. But it is a invaluable maneuver for the most sick of patients who cannot even lie on their back or, 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 or on their abdomen. As you probably all know, COVID-19 patients are not allowed to lie on their back when they're in an advanced and dangerous stage. They have to be in the prone Deep position. Deep rhythmic inhibition is applied to the erector spinae unilaterally. The operator using his thumb and thena remnants between spinous process and transverse process to draw the erector spine at its depth, as always, determined by the tissue resistance and the need to gently and painlessly overbear this resistance. This has proven to be one of the most important maneuvers I've ever come across when treating the bedside patient. Otherwise, the operator can cripple himself because of the difficulties of treating him. With regard to the cervical spine, the operator first comfortably stabilizes the patient's body with his own body weight, gently cradles the patient's temporal region with his forearm and wrist, and uses the head and neck as a lever. The whole spinal segment is taken between the operator's thumb and first and second finger. Examination and treatment is carried on down into the upper thoracic region. The operator's thumb placed lateral to the spinous process or deep to the articular process. Again, diagnosis is not just the operator's hand, palpating hand. The diagnosis is also the resistance felt from the lever down to the point of the application of a fulcrum. It's the conjoint effort that we're looking at. The anterior and lateral rib and costo cartilage articulations are examined and treated easily in this position. Where the patient's comfort permits the supine position, it affords excellent access to all the anterior thoracic and cervical structures and thoracic implant. Note how it is the dance-like use of the operator's body that conveys the primary movement pattern and rhythm. Where it is difficult to induce smooth rhythmic articulation of articular or even abdominal organ structures, it enables the operator to detect and diagnose dysfunction. Particular attention is paid to ensuring that there is no restriction or compromise of neurovascular bundles 
or lymphatic vessels in and around the thoracic inlet. Time and again, you rely on rhythm or lack of rhythm for your diagnosis. The operator must focus as to where that lack of rhythmicity is stemming from. What anatomical structures are causing that lack of rhythmicity? And then he focuses his leverage to overcome that to whatever degree he can at that particular treatment. It requires maximum concentration on the part of the operator. You cannot think of other things at the same time and be effective. Where necessary, enhanced raising and freeing of the cavicle from its underlying attachments is possible, where restriction of movement and potential subclavicular compromise of underlying neurovascular and lymphatic structures is suspected. The patient's upper arm is levered over the operator's thigh as a fulcrum, while the operator encourages further elevation with his fingers pulling upward from beneath the cavicle. The examination treatment continues of the rotator cuff and underlying scapular attachments and scapular rhythm. Particular note is taken of the freedom or otherwise of the first and second ribs articulation and undue scalene muscle tonus. most valuable, minimally invasive, unilateral thoracic lymphatic bump procedure is shown. The patient asks to breathe in rhythm with the maneuver. The pressure must be carefully graded and painless to avoid damage to underlying potentially congested pulmonary parenchyma and fragile inflamed alveoli. It may be contraindicated in infection with severe secretive congestion or consolidation. On the other hand, the modulating negative thoracic pressures induced by the maneuver may play a significant role in augmenting lymphatic flow and drainage of lung secretions. The following maneuver can be detected carefully in the most fragile of patients and was colloquially known as the osteopathic lifesaver or osteopathic mustard plaster. It simultaneously enables a mild thoracic suction pump effect, a release of the superficial and deep thoracic soft tissues of the thorax on their underlying bony attachments and the gradual bilateral mobilization of every part of the thoracic cage. Requiring a high level of manual and body dexterity, the operator engages and grasps the underlying rib angles with one hand, while the upper hand is accurately placed over the same ribs over the anterior chest. Engaging the liver bimanually, the lower hand grasps and pulls superiorly beneath the costovertebral angles, while the organ is squeezed beneath and between the upper and lower hands. This is possibly one of the most difficult maneuvers in osteopathy. It looks so simple. Similarly, on the patient's left side. Treatment is often carried core to include the splenic pump. Again, looking for points of resistance. Whether it is in soft tissue or hard articular structure. Rhythmicity or lack of it may be your only clinical sign that something is wrong. And its restoration or its return, partial or complete, your only sign that things are possibly getting better. Before the patient can even tell you that things are improving. Where the bilateral thoracic pump may be judged too vigorous in the face of advanced pulmonary pathology, the abdominal pump is often a valuable alternative to enhancing lymphatic circulation and leukocyte recruitment simultaneously. 
the hand force vectors are directed caudally, inferiorly, and slightly laterally in the direction of the liver and spleen. Again, the patient's breathing is in time with the rhythm of the pressure. In the treatment of the neck, the placement of the operator's hypothenar eminence beneath the patient's mastoid is essential in order to magnify the coupled vectors directed to the fingers around the spinal segment. Under light traction, Friat's principles of spinal movement are employed as everywhere else in the spine to ensure the minimum of strain to entheses and articular capsules. This was a cervical maneuver used par excellence by Little John who refused to teach or use high velocity manipulative techniques, which he considered potentially dangerous, unphysiological and unnecessary. I am deeply indebted to this particular maneuver. I first saw John Wernham using it and then Hall taught me in greater depth its value. It has enabled me in the hospital setting to treat some of the most delicate and advanced um, patients in terms of their disease condition um, that one could ever wish to see, um, where they were truly fragile, often um, on their last legs in terms of uh, morbidity, perhaps within days or hours of their, their death, but still having to try to help them with their pain and suffering. Um, and yet this maneuver is so physiological and safe that I could feel confident to use it even in those conditions. It would take quite a time for a student to appreciate what is going on. And I can only teach it, I've learned, by taking the student's hands under my hands uh, as we apply the pr protocol, the, the maneuver, um, to a model. Um, that is the way still taught, and I have found that to be the only way sometimes to convey to the uh, student the complex um, maneuver that is involved between hands uh, and the fingers um, and uh, in a way that justifies uh, the use of this maneuver, even in the most dangerous of conditions uh, where perhaps uh, there are major uh, changes in the cervical spine. Yet it looks so that the upper thoracic spine, the operator's thenar eminence is accurately placed beneath the patient's mastoid bones, the fingers engaging the thoracic spinous processes while inducing side bending and rotation to each segment by the leverage of the head and neck. The degree of flexion or extension of the neck is applied as required to enable the maximum facet disengagement. Scalenus. Sternomastoid. In the examination and treatment of the anterior throat structures, particular attention is paid to ensuring the freedom of motion of the hyoid, to which all superior and inferior strap muscles and fascia attach. Note once again the use of push and pull interplay of lever against fulcrum. I'm sometimes asked by a patient as to uh, how they can explain osteopathy to their, to their spouse or to their, to their friends, because um, it's not very easy for them to do so as to what it is that's going on on the table. And I tend to turn around jokingly and say, um, how would you explain to your friend uh, what a surgeon does? And I let them think for a few seconds and I say, well, might you just suggest that the surgeon spends all day um, cutting and sewing, cutting and sewing? And then I suggest, well, look, why don't you suggest that to your friend that an osteospence spends all day pushing and pulling? Because that's really what we're doing all the time. Push and pull. It 
usually raises a laugh. Examination release lymphatismal tension is conducted to ensure free lymphatic flow and reduce painful throat inflammation. Examination and treatment of the myofascia of the face in the case of opportunist infection of the sinuses, eyes, or middle ear. Search is made for points of resistance in all the fascia, myofascial attachments that may impair lymphatic and venous drainage into the thoracic inlet from the eyes, ears, and sinuses. Release of these points of resistance is attempted, followed by maneuvers designed to stimulate lymphatic flow following the anatomical pathways and directions of such flow into cervical lymph glands via the angle of the jaw. In the presence of fever, the deep suboccipital attachments are drawn superiorly and laterally along the nuchal line. Its aim is to down-regulate embedded primary afferent receptors and thus modulate neural signaling to the medullary thermoregulatory center, often reducing the temperature by a half to one degree Celsius in fevers. This can be especially valuable in the vulnerable young child. Where the prone position is possible, Dermal hot or cold spots, pseudomotor changes or stickiness is looked for. A rhythmic oscillatory nave is passed rustrally from the pelvis to the upper thoracic spine, met by the microfulcra of the operator's fingers, lightly stabilizing the segments beneath. Particular attention is paid in lung disease to areas segmentally related to the pulmonary field. Arm leverage is next employed. Note that the lever hand is equally involved in examination of conjoint actions as is the operator's other hand. The insistence on the precisely directed use of long leeches as, as the most safe, effective, and physiological means of diagnosis and treatment is a hallmark of Still and Little John's techniques. And it's all so quiet. That's the important point. You're treating sick patients. It has to be sedative. And it goes for orthopedic cases too. The splenic plump maneuver is possible in the prone position, but not contraindicated clinically. Its depth and rhythm determined by the organ's resistance and the patient's comfort. Comparing and contrasting with the other side, the maneuvers are followed by a liver pump. Oh, I miss those days when I didn't have to wear rubber gloves and a mask. Now seen is deep, slow, inhibitory and sedative pressure from spinous process to the transverse process of the same segment. The attempt is made to approximate as closely as possible to the posterior primary medial ramus of the underlying afferent sensory nerve, from T2 to L2. 
to affect the sympathetic spinal cord gray cells as they converge in the cord with afferent sensory nerve ingress. The rectus spiny are moved laterally ahead of the thumbs. The final demonstration is that of inhibition to the celiac plexus. The operator's fingers moving increasingly deep as the abdominal muscles relax each time the patient breathes out. It's performed in a semicircular direction from 12 o'clock to 12.45 and then partially released till 12 o'clock. Major sympathetic, parasympathetic and nociceptive pathways pass through and converge in the celiac plexus. It is often very tender and its sedation may play a significant part in the more regulated immune response when excessive. It is hoped that this short explanatory video will provide the osteopathic viewer with a window into the range and depth of procedures developed clinically by the founders of the profession in the face of serious systemic disease and epidemics. It is hoped too that they may encourage the viewer to deepen his studies in this field, which has as much clinical relevance today as it did over a century ago, either as a standalone treatment or as an invaluable adju adjuvant. Well, I really hope that was of interest. Um, I would urge you to find time to see it when we upload it together with the text of its principles, um, if it does interest you. I would also urge you to look out for a webinar that was given yesterday, I believe, by my good colleague Christian Fossen, um, who covered the subject uh, in his own way, uh, and in a way that I would highly recommend you to learn from. Uh, he produced a very comprehensive look at the subject as well. Um, I'm open to questions, but I do realize that we've run quite a bit over time because of that delay at the beginning, but I'm happy to stay for any questions if there are any. Thank you very much, Mervyn, and thank you everybody for keeping the, your attention with uh, this great web webinar. Um, I, I want to remark that this footage, I mean, is uh, as I was watching it, it's, it's uh, hundreds and, and thousands of patients behind those uh, maneuvers. It's not as easy and uh, as it looks. Uh, as uh, Melvin says, it looks simple, but for us, um, when we teach uh, undergrad, uh, postgraduate uh, students, it takes. Uh, more than one year to, to run through some of these uh, maneuvers, and especially you are treating the, the sick and the ill patients. Uh, we have a few questions. Uh, we have a question from a uh, Newton clinic, and he's interested, Mervyn, to hear your views and thoughts on, on fever. He says, under what circumstances would you uh, consider appropriate to reduce a uh, fever? And if you do so, what kind of um, uh, methods so, or how you clinically will reduce fever? Okay. You've got to continuously make clinical assessments at the bedside. To what degree can the patient cope with the temperature or is it becoming um, dangerous to the patient? It's a clinical assessment. There's no way that you have any other parameters that you can use. You have to judge whether the breathing is becoming more difficult, whether the child is becoming uh, um, um, dangerously ill. Uh, and those circumstances will require you to lower the temperature. You do that with your hands. I demonstrated a particular procedure in that video, but you'll also use cold body compresses. Um, there comes a time where you may need to use medication. Um, you may have to call the doctor in. You may have to send the patient off to hospital. But in most cases, you can manage the condition by watching the temperature carefully, measuring the temperature carefully, and watching the patient's 
capacity to cope with the temperature. Now, I don't mean difficulty with the pain that often accompanies the temperature, whether it's headaches or neck aches. Um, but obviously, if there's neck pain and the temperature rises, particularly in the child, you start worrying about meningitis. You start testing for neck stiffness. Um, you keep the dangers in mind, but you have responsibilities to treat the patient. And you can treat the patient if you do keep those responsibilities in mind. Yeah, sure. Uh, sorry, so uh, Bill Ferguson, he was saying about uh, your little comment about uh, that you're wearing now mask and gloves in your treatment. Do you ask the patient to wear a, a mask also? Uh, I don't have to because that's the law in Israel now. It came into place about 10 days ago that anyone leaving their home has to wear a mask. So they already arrive, arrive wearing masks. Yeah. Okay, very good. Um, we also have a few questions um, here as well. What are you, your thoughts as you examine the, the patient osteopathically? Do you have any thoughts behind when, when you do so? Um, my chief thought osteopathically is, is there a somatic component that I can find? Is there something dysfunctional that may be related to the patient's symptoms? Um, if I can find a somatic component, it helps me enormously as to know where to concentrate my efforts. Uh, it also allows me to monitor the, the, the progress of the treatment because if I can determine changes after one or two or three treatments in those components, then I know that I'm probably on the right road, even if the patient's symptoms haven't yet improved. And that applies just as much to orthopedic problems. The patient may be in agonizing pain, whether it's cervical pain or, or spinal pain, low back pain, um, as a result, perhaps, of a, a major disc uh, herniation or protrusion or prolapse. Before the patient's pain will improve, I may well already be getting somatic component um, changes for the better, a relaxation of certain soft tissues and myofascial structures. So I will have a certain degree of confidence that I'm on the right track. So that's possibly one of my most important thoughts as I examine a patient. Are there any somatic components here that may be related to the condition the patient is presenting? Yeah, thank yeah. you. Um, there is a question from Mark uh, asking about rhythmicity. I would like to, to quote you one of the, the, the words I took as uh, rhythmicity might be the only sign that something that something goes wrong, and Mark is asking if you could uh, discuss a little bit more how you assess and apply rhythmicity to treatment. If you look carefully at the video, at any point in the video, whatever maneuver I was applying, I was applying it rhythmically. Okay? When you introduce rhythmic movement through the patient's limbs as levers you get feedback. You get feedback as to the degree of resistance to that leverage you're applying. If the maneuver can be applied smoothly, rhythmically, then you probably haven't got any serious somatic dysfunction under your hands between the lever and the foot. So you introduce a rhythmic movement to determine whether the tissues of the patient reacts rhythmically or not. That may be the only sign of dysfunction. When I handle the neck of an infant, for example, I can't possibly feel individual segments of the neck. I haven't been able to after nearly 50 years in practice. When I attempt to identify somatic dysfunction in the articular segments of the infant's spine, it's a mass of jelly. It's so soft and vulnerable and flexible. But what I've learned to pick up very early on, thanks to the instruction of Hall, but also of Werner, is any loss of rhythmicity. It may only be a hint, and it often is only a hint in an infant. It's mainly guesswork based upon that hint and its structures that are so soft. But in the adult, it's much easier. In the adult, you do note that there's a change 
or a resistance to the rhythmicity you're introducing. And that tells you that there's something not quite right there. We're also lucky to, we can compare on the other side of the patient's body. We can compare one side with the other, where one side may be free of the loss of rhythmicity. Yeah. Thank you. Um, it's uh, Dr. Nikita and uh, someone else asking about all these techniques uh, can be given in all the respiratory conditions or are there any conditions where you won't give these techniques? No, that's a very good question. As I said in the video, we may only be able to give one maneuver, for example, the inhibitory maneuver to affect the sympathetic nervous system along the spine the one that almost finished the video. I showed it earlier in, in different positions. You've got to be aware that we can overwhelm the sick patient very easily. I don't mean just sick systemically. I mean also an orthopedic patient. It is very easy to overtreat, to irritate, to overwhelm and exhaust the patient because of the mechanical effects that we're producing. Any Mechanotransduction that we introduce by our forces has to be accommodated by the patient. It takes energy on the cellular level for the patient to deal with the afferent input that we're applying through our forces. We have to continuously be aware that we can overdo it, that we can overtreat, and that we can end up making the patient worse very easily. I've done it time and again. I still do it occasionally, and I still regret it every time. It's so difficult to know when enough is enough, and yet you still have to be effective. You still have to do something that's going to produce a physiological response. And the only way I know that one can teach that is to have students as apprentices, apprentices that they sit hour after hour watching treatment after treatment and absorbing internalizing just how short the procedures are in the hands of an experienced operator. Most students do not have the confidence, and most recent graduates, new graduates, don't have the confidence that doing a maneuver for diagnosis or treatment purposes in an accurate, surgically accurate way uh, for a short period of time is sufficient to produce an effect. They feel the patient needs more, wants more, must have more, uh, to uh, to uh, earn the the money they're paying, it, it just isn't that. It is not medically sound treatment if you do that, and it goes wrong, disastrously wrong, when you're treating sick patients or very vulnerable patients. Yeah, so some people are uh, asking about um, you know most uh, patients, uh, mo most countries are not uh, allowing osteopaths to treat. COVID-19 people. Do you have any concerns for your health as well? If you are treating any patients with uh, the viral infection or how, yes. how do you see that? Yes, it is a worry, but I treat influenza patients every year and far more die of influenza. And I catch influenza once every few years. I have to you know, build up my immunity in, in the natural way. When you enter the medical profession, you have to do so knowing that you're going to take risks, that you're going to be more exposed than an ordinary member of the public to sick patients. Yes, thank you. Um, I, I, well, we have more questions. I don't know if, uh, if, if it's going too long for you, Marion, and you have to... I'm okay for the moment. I'm okay. okay. Yeah. Okay, so... Um, uh, you, you mentioned uh, some of the signs that you pick up from the patient. Uh, what, what are the, the, those uh, uh, signs that you pick up from the from the patient when enough is enough? You were saying. Yeah. Um, you don't necessarily pick up from the patient as to when to stop, um, unless you are irritating them and they tell you that it's causing more pain, for example, or they'll tell you that they're feeling exhausted by what you're doing. But that hopefully doesn't happen too often because hopefully you don't make that mistake too often. The more subtle changes are not something you pick up with palpation. It's clinical experience. 
And it's a belief that if you've done the maneuver properly and accurately, that is enough for the moment, for that session. There is no identifying clinical signs that I know of that clearly tell you enough is enough. Just clinical experience and hopefully what you've internalized from watching far more experienced operators than yourself in your education. But your clinical experience will pick up quickly if you listen to patients reporting what happened after your treatment. You will be surprised that if you've done five or 10 minutes of accurate treatment in an, an acute patient, that their response can be very powerful and very effective. And when you hear that enough times, you begin to believe that you don't need to spend more than possibly 15 minutes at the most on treating a sick patient or an injured patient. How do you fill in the rest of the time so that your, the payment you received is justified? Well, there's a lot of time you can spend teaching patients to know what is pain. Um, you can educate them as to how they can help themselves to deal with pain. You can explain to them what is pain and you can explain to them what is their medical condition, all of which they're very keen to know about in a language that they can understand. So the time can be filled up quite happily without necessarily over-treating them physically. Yes, thank you. Just a pin design, if you could stop sharing the, the, um, the screen. Yes. And then we can see you. A bit I'm better. very sorry, yeah. I'm sorry. I'm That's sorry. it, perfect. Um, we had someone else, uh, I mean, a lot of questions and um, uh, honestly, Mervyn, a lot of interest in, in the subject. Um, they say, uh, what are the, um, some of the techniques to, to enhance uh, immunity uh, in the patient, I would suppose? Yeah. Okay, we've got to be very careful with our medical language. Many patients are suffering because of the immune response. But the immune response is overactive very often. And it's not an easy clinical line to draw as to whether you want to boost the immune response of the patient or whether you want to dampen the response of the patient because it's become overwhelming. Um, again, these are all clinical decisions you have to make at the bedside. One of the ways you may want to be directed is by way of the pain response when you, for example, handle the liver or the spleen. If it is painful or distinctly uncomfortable for the patient as you begin to apply lightly your liver pump or your splenic pump, then I would be very wary to continue. It's an indication that that organ may already be working overtime. And in fact, you don't want to encourage it any further. But rely rather on encouraging lymphatic flow through treating the thoracic cage, the diaphragm, and the sympathetic supply to the lymphatic system. But where you feel that the patient is not um, able to um, rise to the occasion and the immune system is working sluggishly, then you can begin to apply as a testing procedure, as a trial run, one or two treatments where lymphatic pumps are included, not treatments on their own right. They are a small part of the treatment and they don't take very long to apply. It's within a minute to two minutes. It's not five minutes of splenic pumps to produce a massive rise in leukocyte count. No, that may not be necessary, and it's very rarely necessary. It's just to help the body in the right direction. Thank you. Yes, Marvin. Yeah, I, I, as you say, helping the body. Uh, we are helping uh, all of you in the right direction. And uh, as some people are asking for uh, further information, I would just uh, appreciate if you just log in into the 
uh, ICO website or uh, write an email to ICO front desk at gmail.com. And this uh, webinar plus the, the video that Mervin was showing will be available in, in YouTube. Is, uh, we, we need to edit it and it will be available for, for you. But uh, as Mervin was uh, indicating, I mean, uh, we are not trying to push people to go out and, and to treat uh, sick patients. This is just the, the aim of the, the ICO is to um, to remind the profession that uh, there is a remarkable capacity to help people. But obviously, this has to be learned. Uh, we are uh, British, uh, UK osteopaths that you know we we went through university and and got the. Uh, all the degrees so it's not that we want osteopaths um out there to to you know to go crazy now but this is quite quite serious stuff so uh, i would like it you know to take it uh, precisely as uh, mervin is saying and w maybe watching as well uh, the video of um christian fossum that was in the efo uh, youtube channel this morning and uh, you you can take an average on, on the views about treating these kind of conditions um, Just yes. can I remind the audience, can I remind the audience, we're talking sometimes about our nearest relatives. It could be your wife, your husband, your children, your grandchildren, your grandparents. There can't be people nearer to you who may be suffering respiratory diseases. I don't expect young graduates necessarily experiment on patients but you have your nearest and dearest who are often more than happy to let you try to help them during these conditions they can be the very first patients on which you gain experience and then comes your friends your close friends are very often more than happy to have you try to treat them before rushing off to medication that is often quite dangerous Yes, thank you. Thank you, Mervyn. Um, maybe we can ask the last question um, to yeah. Mervyn. Um, well, it, it's something that, is there a difference between uh, body adjustment, GOT, and other techniques like biodynamics and uh, these techniques that we hear all in, in within the osteopathic? Is this osteopathy for you, everything, or do you just call osteopathy something more specific? <laughs> um, I can only talk to you about classical osteopathy. I fell in love with it nearly 50 years ago. And to see it applied today as I do in an ultra-modern leading world, world leading hospital, for me, is very fulfilling. Um, I know that if still or little John walked into the department and was watching me treat, for example, that little infant I told you about that's on YouTube, I'm sure they would be smiling um, um, very, very broadly um, to see it being applied today. As to whether other approaches work, I can't tell you. I've never looked at them too deeply. I've been so wrapped up in perfecting and in improving um, what made such an impression on me when I saw it so many years ago. Um, so I can't pass judgment. All I would say is, are they, are these methods changing, significantly changing the somatic component that is so often present in disease and injured conditions? And if a somatic component isn't readily found, are these methods still able to produce profound physiological responses in a patient. Because very often you won't find a somatic component. Even Little John admitted that and said, look, you still got to get on and treat the patient. Know the pathology, know what physiological effects you can produce with classical osteopathy and get on with it um, at the bedside. So if these other methods are able to prove themselves at the bedside, of the truly sick patient, then good luck. Thank you, Mary. Thank you very much. Uh, it's, it's been a wonderful and um, 
I, I do appreciate, you know, as chairman of the ICO, you are, um, well, one of my, my uh, closest uh, teachers of osteopathy. And uh, I keep having uh, messages from, from everyone. But I have to say that all the ICO team, uh, teachers, uh, were behind the, the screen as well watching. And, and and they all appreciate how how much uh, how good you do for osteopathy and and, th and those words, and also uh, to remark uh, after so many years of practice, uh, I would like to uh, uh, thank that you you look so happy to practice osteopathy and you look so well and so so much in support and uh, it's not easy I suppose if you just treat minor orthopedic uh, cases uh, you, you get possibly you get bored of, the, of that so osteopathy has got much more behind of um, just these these minor cases it was one of the greatest decisions i made in my life to actually go into hospital practice to challenge myself and try to prove whether classical osteopathy actually works yes definitely and it, it does work yes yeah, as, as we say we hope things uh, change uh, not, in, always, in, not always diego well, yeah, no, of course. And as you okay. said, we we work along uh, medical doctors and nurses. It's not we are, you know, working by ourselves, but um, yeah, we do the best we can. But thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Mervyn. Have a, a nice, uh, peaceful evening. And thank you, everybody, who just been logging. There's still 83 people uh, uh, watching. So thank you for being there for one hour and a half. Uh, as as we say, uh, we, we can help as much as we can through through this online uh, te technique. Uh, but hopefully, we can see you in the, in the lecture room and carry on with the teaching. Okay. So thank you. Bye bye, everyone. Now and um, yeah, thank you, Mervin, and uh, see you soon. Then bye bye.